In my last video, I talked about one of my favorite racing games of all time, in which I made some closing remarks about how the current state of racing games pales in comparison to what many consider the classic era of racing games. Depending on who you ask, this generally encompasses the 2000s, although some may say it goes slightly beyond. My personal time frame stretches from April 28th, 2001 to October 29th, 2012. I'll get to why those dates are important later. To illustrate why I believe the current moment in gaming doesn't match up to them, I'm going to divide it by franchise, starting with... Come on. Need for Speed is the quintessential racing franchise. It being the best selling. Wait, really? It being the best selling racing game franchise of all time. Need for Speed at its peak was so popular that its greatest titles in terms of sales are nearly equivalent to that of Elden Ring. And I say it's pretty obvious why. These games managed to simultaneously follow the trends of their day while also making something timeless. Like, take a look at this car. When you see that car, if you play video games pretty much at all, you think of Need for Speed, and you probably think this is sick. You want to know the craziest thing? The majority of games during this era were made on a one year turnover. Now granted, that often becomes apparent with the amount of pure jank present on some of these titles, but the developers managed to never have the jank break the game entirely or bring the player out of the experience for more than a moment. The biggest thing this era of Need for Speed had going for it was its innovations and building upon what the series had already established going into the 2000s, but also on the culture of the day. If you wanted to get the best customization, cop chases, music, and 2000s speed aesthetic, you went for Need for Speed. I'd say their classic games encompass the black box era stretching from Hot Pursuit 2 through Most Wanted and Carbon, we don't talk about Undercover, and ending with The Run. A Need for Speed game is why I set the end date for my timeline, but I'll get to that soon. <music> Gran Turismo is by far the most consistent series I've found in terms of quality. I have a bit of a hard time calling really any of their games bad even today. The Gran Turismo series has a bit of an odd place in my opinion, but it fills that niche quite well, being both realistic enough to have its own dedicated esports sim league as well as many real life professional drivers that use it as training material for track racing, but also being arcade like in other areas just enough as to not alienate casual players or require a wheel just to play the game. Gran Turismo 3 was a great way to start off the series coming onto the 6th generation consoles, being released on April 28, 2001, marking the start of my timeline, with a new coat of paint and some brand new features coming along with it. It even came with some great music. Don't believe me? Well, you're listening to it right now. Having been developed alongside Gran Turismo 2, it's astonishing what they were able to get out of the PS2, especially when it was only out for a year at that point, making the system much harder to optimize for. Although it wasn't without compromises, having less than a third the number of cars when compared to GT2, this wouldn't stop the game from being the best-selling Gran Turismo and PlayStation 2 exclusive game of all time, as well as the second best-selling PS2 game, Flat, only being beat out by San Andreas. Then they came out with Gran Turismo 4, a game many have coveted as one of the greatest racing games of all time. This is the Tepimpa Butterfly or Pulp Fiction of racing games to many people being made with such care and attention to detail while also being very commercially successful. My opinion on GT4, it definitely lives up to its moniker as the real driving simulator and does have incredible quality all around, but I don't know if I'd go as far as to call it the greatest racing game of all time. Overall, the accessibility, quality handling and physics, 
it usually having the biggest car list of any game in this generation, and having very few technical bugs or faults, make Gran Turismo one of the all-time great franchises, even to an extent outside of racing games. My only real problem with the series was that, well, I didn't grow up with it, so much of my commentary on its merits only comes from what I can easily see today. But that also benefits me, doing this video as I look at the franchise, at least I won't be looking at it through rose-tinted Oakley crankshafts. Now Forza. Forza, compared to the other racing games in this era, entered the game relatively late, with Forza Motorsport releasing on May 3rd, 2005, and similar to Gran Turismo, their best work would come in their third and fourth installments. Nowadays, the Forza series is primarily known for the Horizon side of their franchise, primarily because they have a wider appeal and the fact that there hasn't been a new motorsport in nearly six years now. Forza Horizon 1 was my introduction to the series, and in my opinion, it's the best the franchise had. Although many say that Horizon 3 was the best, which I can't honestly say I disagree with, because Horizon 3 is still very good, I just more or less prefer Horizon 1's style and atmosphere over 3. It also looks incredible for a game from 2012, or at least it would if it wasn't kinda kneecapped by the 7th gen piss filter. Although for this game it kind of works to give it sort of that party at sunset and into the night kind of feel. When the primary focus of your games is sanctioned street races centered around a music festival, then outside of the core features of really any racing game, the music, atmosphere, and relatability of the game become core elements. Similar to the early Need for Speed games, Forza Horizon had great music, whether you were into rock, Breezy pop. Solid EDM. Or just great dance music. Forza had something for you. The game also succeeded in giving the player a sense of purpose with the story of the game. You weren't just trying to be the best, you were trying to wipe that smug look off Duke Maguire's face, or really showing Darius Flint who's boss. And those characters and events, although they didn't have the depth of a Tarantino movie, did make the game feel more lively, and gave the, at some points, grindy progression a real sense of purpose. Midnight Club has a special place for me, as I have fond memories of just being 5 years old and playing Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition on my OG Xbox, and then again whenever I was a bit older, I was playing Midnight Club LA on my 360. Midnight Club in many ways was Rockstar's answer to the need for speeds and juice of the early 2000s, even though the original Midnight Club predates that style becoming mainstream by about 3 or 4 years. Midnight Club to me has always had a strong vibe of what it was, and although it never changed that much between entries and concept, the increasing quality in its execution made it just that much better with each installment. Midnight Club, as the name suggests, is all about night racing, and everything from the music to the character interactions to the style of the cars and environment just gives us a strong urban nighttime feel. Like you could roll up to any of the spots you wager pink slips at to race, and there'd be a party going on down lower in the building. It actually differentiates itself more by having dynamic cop chases, physical power-ups to unlock, and a story that often exceeded its contemporaries in quality. Midnight Club is truly one of the classic racing franchises. And who could forget Burnout? Burnout was always kind of the series that just had a bit of a screw loose, but in a good way. Yeah, you could primarily play Burnout for the races with the unique cars and soundtrack, but we all know why anyone played Burnout.
you couldn't get a better near cathartic explosion simulator in the 2000s. I'd say the only game that gives me a similar feeling of watching a 12 car pile up now would maybe be Beam NG. Burnout was a very simple game. It didn't have any of the customization or creative writing of Need for Speed or Midnight Club, or the sim feel of Gran Turismo, but what it was, was fun. I can't think of a dull moment while playing these games. Now granted, I'm only looking at about half the series, my introduction being with Burnout 3 and having only played It, Revenge, and Paradise, but all three in their own way present a great series that just had so much to offer in its simple idea and great execution. I'd say try out Burnout if you're ever feeling burnt out of the current series. Yeah, I'll see myself out. Now, there were many other great racing game franchises that were around at this time. The only reason I have less to say about them is that I haven't played the majority of them. Take the Driver series, one of the best-selling racing game franchises of all time. The only game in the series that I really know much about is Driver San Francisco, a game which, from what I've seen, is radically different from not only most other racing games, but most other driver games with this implementation of the body switching mechanic. This unique feature, as well as other aspects of the gameplay, make Driver San Francisco a standout among its contemporaries. Or take the Test Drive series, a franchise that spans all the way back to 1987 and made quality titles throughout its history, but achieved true acclaim through the Unlimited series. These games were pioneers for many aspects of their time whether it be in their decision to have a map taken directly from a real-life location, character customization that is akin to what can be found in GTA V today, or a cheesy story reminiscent of plenty of other 2000s racing games. Like with Driver, I haven't actually played Test Drive, so I can't really comment in detail, but from what I've seen, I would definitely be down to try it. One aspect of the game I find particularly interesting are the large and detailed showrooms previously only seen in games like the Project Gotham Racing series. Oh, how could I forget Project Gotham? Back in the early 2000s, they were Microsoft's answer to Gran Turismo before Forza, and it was actually one of the series that I grew up with. I always liked the feel Project Gotham had of a Simcade racing on real streets with a massive car list. They also had that real 2000s vibe in the menus, presentation, and music that I and many others enjoy so much. I would actually have more to say about it, but there's actually no story or customization or many of the other bells and whistles found in other games. So the game is almost as simple as I've described, but it does it so well as to have its lack of progression not distract from how, just how fun the game is. But there's plenty others. You had Colin McRae Dirt, or as it's known now, just Dirt, which was a great series based on the World Rally Championship. It was actually my introduction to Rally. You had Grid, a fun and well-presented Simcade track racer with interesting game modes, and a physics engine that, while it did sacrifice some of its realism to make the game funnier to witness and more enjoyable, it was still a great time all around. You have the Tokyo Extreme Racer franchise, which I've already done a video on, which was a masterwork of nighttime street racing on the Wangan highways of Tokyo, as well as the mountain passes of the Kaido region. There were also the real-life motorsport games like NASCAR Thunder or F1 Career Challenge, both of which were great ways to introduce someone to those motorsports through an engaging game. And there were plenty more that I either haven't found or just can't fit in here, but all of these titles are what made this era of racing games great and cause it to be nostalgic for many people. But going forward, what happened to all these titles, especially the smaller ones? Well... The vast majority of the smaller franchises barely made it out of the decade. Most of the ones that were left were only either left in spirit making remastered versions of their old games, or left making things that weren't even recognizable to what they had started as, or were just of middling quality. But let's take a step back and look at what series we did have left.
Need for Speed kicked off the new decade with Hot Pursuit, a return to the formula that had started the franchise's rise to dominance back in 2002. And while it wasn't bad, it was a departure from what the series had been going for, with the implementation of features such as Break to Drift and the lack of any customization in the game, which actually wouldn't return for another five years. The release of Hot Pursuit also signaled another change to the series, with it being the first mainline title since 2002 not to be made by EA Black Box, instead being handled by Criterion Games, creators of the Burnout series. While they were a very skilled studio when it came to making racing games, there must have been some mismanagement at EA at the time for them to not be able to reach the heights found in the Black Box era. And this would be most exemplified in 2012, with the release of Most Wanted 2012. This game is the reason why I set my dates so specifically, because the day after Most Wanted was released, a half-baked, poorly executed attempt at cashing in on the name that was the series' biggest property, with poor physics, overly sensitive cars, very little progression, and the most you could do to change your car or customize it was a randomly selected color you could get at a gas station. Seeing this, EA decided to pull Criterion from Need for Speed development and instead put in Ghost Games, who wouldn't do much better either, with the next three installments fully handled by them being the most critically and commercially panned in the series, with each game having a unique set of flaws and core issues. Now they've put Criterion back in the saddle, but has only just brought them out of their slump, and I imagine it will take some time for them to return to the greatness they once had. Gran Turismo was so close to being the shiny example of what a modern racing game from a classic franchise could be. And then... Okay. Oh. That should tell you just about all you need to know. The path Gran Turismo had been going on up to this point, except for Gran Turismo Sport, which I'll get to in a moment, was still being followed with GT7, being a great simulator, or simcade rather, with a massive car list and great customization. The only problem being how they decided to monetize the game. They took the same approach as a scummy mobile game or Battlefront 2, where all the greatest unlockables, i.e. the best cars, were either locked behind tens of hours of gameplay to be able to afford one car, or just putting up as much as $200. This value proposition sat well with basically no one, which is why we ended up with a critically acclaimed game with a trashed image. They got so much community backlash from this that they actually did partially course correct and made many in-game payouts much greater, but the damage in the public eye had already been done. And Gran Turismo Sport, the earlier game in this era from 2017, wasn't without its problems either, with it being a near complete overhaul to the core of the game. Instead of being a Simcade racer, primarily focused on the single-player progression up the ranks of various racing series, it was nearly a full racing sim, which did practically require a wheel just to play it, and which made the single-player campaign take a backseat to the multiplayer, which had its own issues. These changes not only alienated many of the casual players, but also many who had been playing the game for over a decade, and never wanted nor expected Gran Turismo to go in that direction. Oh Forza. At one point Forza was basically my favorite game, period and I've put nearly a year in total into all the Horizon games, especially 1 and 4. And I can't say I had an awful experience my time playing 4, even if I look back on it now as being a game of extremely poor quality. Here, my best way of thinking about the Horizon franchise is by comparing it to Dragon Ball, where Horizon 1 is OG Dragon Ball, Simple, down-to-earth, more story-centric and lively, but with the core tenets of the series going forward being established there. Horizon 2 and 3 are more like Dragon Ball Z, taking likely what you enjoyed about the original and doing it more, bigger, louder, as well as expanding upon the spectacle. 
These are also the most popular parts of the series. Makes sense. Horizon 4 is a bit like Dragon Ball Super, with the same formula the series had been going on up to that point, but with some kind of unnecessary changes that no one was really a big fan of. Not a massive departure from the formula, only a notable dip in overall quality, although hardcore fans of the series may have found it fairly disappointing. And 5 is... Full power of para. And I now welcome the sweet embrace of death. Yeah. The last two installments of Forza, in my opinion, have been two of the most disappointing games I've played. Take Forza Horizon 4, for example. When this game came out, it was nearly on par with Fallout 76 in terms of how many bugs they were. Um... You had buggy texture glitches, falling through the floor, clipping into the floor, clipping into buildings, infinite money glitch, broken servers, and more. And those are just the unintentional problems. You had no class-based rivals like every other Forza, poor physics that made literally every car feel understeery, as well as allowing everyone to literally Ross Chastain their way around every corner of every race course, poor track design, again, a complete lack of any story or progression, with your starting cars being what you would normally get at the three hour mark in Horizon 1, music that, while not bad, wasn't the catalogue of bangers or near chart toppers that we had in Horizon 1 or really 2 and 3, which you kind of need if it's going to be a game set in a music festival. DLC content and passes that were sort of a rip-off value-wise, an awful upgrade system for racers that led to absolutely disgusting meta builds, no gifting of cars, no selling of cars, and a carless that, despite being the most diverse in the series, felt the most samey among similar types of cars. And if all that sounds bad, well... There's more! Horizon 5 had nearly all of these problems, uh, along with a car list 98% recycled from Horizon 4, terrible optimization for PC, awful handling for people on wheel setups, and even more broken servers. And brakes that would only work consistently if you turn on ABS. If not, you will lock your brakes at some point without expecting it. If it seems like I'm putting more into Forza's faults than anyone else's, it's because I am. Not only because I find it to be a prime example of the decline in racing games, but also because I have so many problems with Forza now that I originally planned on making a separate video on just Forza, but I figured it really just be better to put it here. And if you thought the Motorsport series was going to be any better, not really. Because Motorsport 5 is considered the worst in the Motorsport uh. series, 6 was good, but nothing super special or innovative, and 7 was just kind of mediocre. The only hope I have left in this series now is the rebooting of the Forza Motorsport name. We'll just kind of have to see how that turns out. Along with all the aforementioned problems, most of these games, particularly Need for Speed and Forza, have fallen victim to the strategy that many studios have fallen into recently, which is to set a game deadline, realize it's not going to be anywhere near completion by then, then kind of cobble it together so that it can be shipped at launch, leaving us with buggy, unpolished crap. But with most of the big classic franchises going downhill and most of the smaller classics not around anymore, what do we have left in terms of racing games? Well, let me tell you, it's not nearly as bad as it may seem. First of all, these games not being great works that will be played 10 years in the future like the classics doesn't mean someone can't have fun playing these. Hell, I complain about the amount of problems in the two most recent Forza games, yet I wouldn't have put the amount of time I did into them if I didn't, at least at one point, find them enjoyable. But oftentimes, when I'm playing with my friends on Horizon 4 or Need for Speed Heat, it feels less like I'm having fun with my friends because of the game we're playing, and more in spite of it, and just how funny some of the issues can be at times. Another thing is, as the old guard of classic games have come to pass, new titles have come up instead. Wreckfest out of the old team that worked on Flat Out, Project Cars out of the old team that made Need for Speed Shift, which reminds me, there is a major section of racing games that has made a massive growth in popularity and quality in the last 10 years, that being Sim Racers. Sim 
Sim racing has been around nearly as long as racing games themselves have, but up until fairly recently, the technology to get a truly realistic virtual racing experience was far too expensive and impractical for most people. Now I can pick up a G29 and a copy of Assetto Corsa for 250 and just get to running laps. Sim racers of all kinds, whether it be for Formula One, WRC, GT3, NASCAR, or otherwise, there's been great titles out there that will give you a great feel for that motorsport and may even be a good way to introduce someone to it. Shoot, I got into Formula One through a combination of the F1 2019 game and someone in a Discord posting the full Alpha Max Nova season highlights, which I highly recommend checking out. You can copy. And that Soleil remember of this Grand Prix. But, didn't one of your drivers get on the podium that weekend? Maybe. Any more questions? Yes, I wanted to ask something about the Emola's Grand Prix. Ah, for fun. One area I would really recommend people checking out is what's come out of the indie gaming and modding scene for the past few years. You like Rally? Get Art of Rally in my summer car. You like drifting? Get Car X Drift. You like street racing? get super, well, uh, maybe not. But you get the point. The indie scene has produced tons of varied games, some of which I'd recommend alongside some of the classic old favorites. Check Steam or YouTube for what's really going on there. But just as vibrant as the indie scene is the classic modding scene. You have simple stuff like modding improved textures or extra cars into Gran Turismo 4 or the old Need for Speeds, but then you have stuff like Need for Speed Carbon Battle Royale. No, not like that which completely overhauls the game's progression and events, as well as adding a ton of new cards. Or take the Papega mod for Most Wanted, a massive overhaul of just about everything in Most Wanted, sans the map and physics engine, with the entire map, cars, and characters being reworked around memes and in-jokes from the community of the YouTuber KuruHS. Like completely, who is Kuru? Exactly, who is he? I'm also really excited for the upcoming release of Pro Street Papega on April 1st, and I suggest you take it out too. So overall, do I think racing games have been on a decline? I'd say yes, at least in the AAA space, but I don't see this as 100% a bad thing, because there are still plenty of quality games being made. You just have to look a bit more to find them, but also... Sometimes you just have to experience the bad in order to truly appreciate when something is exceptionally good.